I uh, thank God every day for the privilege that I have of traveling around the world and help people find their freedom in Christ. And I really believe that what we're going to share here for the next few minutes is probably the most important uh, truth that I can share anywhere in the world, and that's the need to forgive from our hearts. Before we look at this, let me uh, draw a very critical distinction between two different issues. They may involve the same two people at the same time, but they're two very different issues. When the Bible says if you go to church and remember that your brother has something against you, then just leave your offering and, and go be reconciled. In other words, if you've done something to hurt somebody else, well, don't go to God. Go to that person and become reconciled. Go ask forgiveness, seek reconciliation. We're not dealing with that tonight. A lot of people get that confused with my need to forgive somebody else. In that case, don't go to that person. Go to God. Now, we want to explain why that's the case. That's why you could actually do this here. That's why in an office I can help somebody forgive from their heart. They may or may not be reconciled later on. But the first step has to be one of forgiveness. So take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, please, to uh, Matthew chapter 6, a very familiar passage, the one you've recited probably thousands of times. It's the Lord's Prayer. But listen to it uh, this evening now. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, I'm not sure you've read that very carefully, but if you think about it for a moment, you may not be asking for very much here. Now, isn't that interesting that in terms of way that we would relate to God in this model prayer as we would petition the sovereign ruler of this universe, and he's suggesting, if you want to come to me, then you seek my forgiveness as you would forgive others. The reason, I believe, is, is that our relationship with God is inextricably bound up in our relationship with our fellow man. You really can't have a, a right relationship with God in exclusion of other people. Even on the love side, in 1 John 4, it says, How can you say you hate your brother and love me? How can the love of God abide in you? And when it comes to this whole issue of forgiveness, he's saying, As you approach me, Lord, you forgive me as I have forgiven other people. You can see that even in the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is like unto it. Now, he, they didn't ask him for that, but he's going to tell them anyway. The second is like unto that, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so my relationship with God, if I fall in love with him, there would be a natural consequence of falling in love with my fellow man as well. I simply cannot have a relationship with God that's meaningful, that's righteous, that's right, in exclusion of those who are around me. Then he goes on to say, uh, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as though he were going to come back and make a comment on this, he said, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, let me clarify something here. We are in the gospel period of time. What is not at stake for you presently, if you are a believer, your sins are forgiven, is not your destiny. That's not at stake here. But your daily victory, I'm for sure, is. Whether or not you want to live in a righteous relationship with God. Now, the most definitive teaching on this is Matthew chapter 18. Turn there with me. Matthew chapter 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Now, he's not suggesting you keep a pocket calculator and count to... 490 and then pull a gun. Uh, the point is, you continue to forgive, is what he's saying. He said, For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, 10,000 talents is way beyond a lifetime wage. The point is, repayment is not an option, it's an impossibility. Same is true for you and me in our relationship with God. 
Whether or not we could repay God the debt that we owe him is not a possibility. We couldn't save ourselves, in other words. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me. Literally, it's have mercy with me, and I'll repay you in everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Now, three concepts again. Justice, mercy, grace. Justice. Justice is rightness. It's fairness. It's, it's eye for eye in that sense. If I meted out, or better, if God meted out justice, we would get what we deserve. That would be justice. Justice was finally served. He got what he deserved. Now, if you and I got what we deserved, what would we get? Hell. That's what we would get. No matter how hard we tie, our righteousness will still be like a dirty rag before God. But God, being rich in mercy, has saved us, not by deeds done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Now, God cannot be unjust. He couldn't just turn his back and wink and say, for a moment... In relationship to you, I will no longer be a just God. That would be an impossibility. That justice had to be served. That's why that penalty that we deserve fell on Christ. So that justice was satisfied. But justice and mercy are like the two different sides, really the same coin of God. God is both just, he's also merciful. Being rich in mercy, he has seen fit that we have experienced salvation. Now mercy would be not giving you and I what we deserve. When somebody throws themselves upon the mercies of God, they're really hoping that I won't get what I deserve. That's not the same as grace. Grace is actually giving us what we don't deserve. That would be grace. Now this is how we ought to relate to one another. As our Father has loved us, so are we to love others. In other words, we are not to give other people what they deserve, we are to be merciful as God has been merciful to us and then take the next step, give people what they don't deserve, love one another. That's the whole model for us in the Bible in terms of how we relate to other people. Now let's go on. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him, verse 27, and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a denarii was a day's wages. Now, let's not minimize this, because people can really do great damage to one another. But it's, it's really incredibly small compared to 10,000 talents. Uh, but there's damage that is done here. And, um, and he began to seize him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground, began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay, will repay you. But he was unwilling, and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slave saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved, and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother. Now he has another condition from your heart. The word torture there is interesting. Every use of that in the New Testament really is in reference to spiritual torment. It's actually the same word that the demons use when they look at Christ. Why are you tormenting, tormenting us? Now, part of this is to realize the debt to which you and I have been forgiven. 10,000 talents. We can't dare forget from where we have fallen ourselves. Now, the problem is, you're very nice people. <laughs> Don't let it go to your head, but by and large, I'm pretty... Sure, you're somewhat the cream of the crop in this community. There's a danger in that, however. After a while, you can start adopting an attitude like this. Well, I needed salvation, but that guy over there, oh man, he really needs it. You need it as bad as he does. 
It's like the story in Luke chapter 18 where the self-righteous Pharisee was pounding himself in the chest and claiming how many times he fasted and prayed and was so happy he wasn't like that miserable sinner there and that poor miserable sinner. He was beating himself on the chest and crying, oh God have mercy upon me. And the Lord said, I'll tell you which one of these two uh, were justified before me today. And it's the one who threw himself upon the mercies of God. And all of us that are Christians have found that wonderful uh, forgiveness in God by coming to him in such a state. There's a tremendous story told in Luke about a Pharisee by the name of Simon who threw a party, invited all the noble people in town to come. He also invited Jesus, but a sinner happened to slip through the back door and uh, was uh, kissing him profusely and wouldn't stop doing it and uh, wept over him and uh, wiped his feet with her hair and her tears and anointed his head with oil. And Simon just gets sick. He said, well, if he was a prophet, he would know what sort of woman that she is. And the Lord said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Suppose one has been forgiven a $500 debt and another one a $200 debt. He said, which one do you think would love the most? Well, maybe the one who's been forgiven the $500 debt. He said, you've answered correctly. He said, do you see this woman? When I came to your house, you never greeted me with a kiss. She hasn't stopped kissing me since I came. You never anointed my head with oil, but she did. You never washed my feet, but she has with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You see, those who have been forgiven much, love much. Those who have been forgiven little, love little. Now, question, how much have you been forgiven? Little or much? Apparently, it's going to have some effect on how we relate or love other people. We can never forget from where we've fallen. Be gracious every day with the incredible salvation that God has given us. We've all deserved hell, but God has given us eternal life. All of this, I believe, is required for our own personal freedom. By and large, as I understand it, I'm forgiven before God. Uh, but the need for me to forgive others is really for my own sake and my own walk with God. Remember the passage we looked at uh, earlier on in this series where Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I urge you to forgive for we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. And God himself says if we're going to carry that bitterness, he himself will turn us over to the tormentors. Well, what is forgiveness? Maybe we need to look at a good definition as to what forgiveness really is. First of all, it's not forgetting. He said, well, God forgets. No, God couldn't forget if he wanted to. God is omniscient. It's impossible for God to forget. But the Bible says, I will remember your sin no more. Now, that's true, but that doesn't mean he forgets. Actually, the Greek word we use for that is amnesia. And what they do is they use the same word we use in our communion formula, do this in remembrance of me. Now, as I understand that phrase, he's not suggesting we get together once a month and, oh, yes, I remember now, 2,000 years ago, Christ died for my sins and was resurrected that I would have life. That's not what he's talking about. Actually, as I understand that passage, do this in remembrance of me, that which was accomplished in the life of Christ some 2,000 years ago, you apply that to your life today. When he says, I will remember your sin no more, what he's saying is, is that I will not take the past and use it against you. I will put it as far away from me as the east is to the west. Forgetting may be a long-term byproduct of forgiving. It is never a means to it. Experientially, you know that. Have you ever been hurt and said, well, I'm just going to forget about it? Could you? Now you understand what the tormenting is all about. I mean, you just can't get it off your mind. It just eats away at you. It doesn't work. And when somebody says to their spouse, well, two years ago you did this. Do you know what they just said? I haven't forgiven you. What's going to happen to a relationship where we keep throwing our past against each other? And what's that do to us, for that matter? So it's not forgetting. It's not tolerating sin. Does God forgive? Yes, he does. He's a forgiving God. Does he tolerate sin? He can't tolerate sin. It's impossible for a holy, righteous God to do that. And so the whole plan that he worked out for you and I, that we would be alive and free in Christ, has been made for us. But he doesn't ask us to tolerate sin either. In fact, he is calling the church to be holy as he is holy. Now, I've got to go back and share my experience with this. Many years ago when I taught at Talbot, I taught our basic ethics class. We called it Church and Society. 
I lectured for about five or six weeks. And then the rest of the class, I divided them up into major, major social ills of domestic violence and, and government education, other major problems that we were struggling with in society. Uh, I, I just love to teach a class because uh, I would break the class down into specific problems and they were to go out and, and do some research and come back and tell us who was working with these issues and distribute resource material to the other students. And then they were to bring in the best speaker they could find that, that really was called by God to address this in our society. And so we just got some great uh, people coming into class and they would poem the lecture. and it, That was their burden. And I would always have to tell them, don't pick up everybody's burden, but at least hear them. Because it will affect how we relate, you know, as a church and society trying to function together. Well, I remember for the first three years, a lady came in from a shelter for battered wives. It was a Christian ministry. And I, I look forward to that because I said, what a great ministry. I said, good for you. God bless you for what you're doing, providing sh uh, shelter and safety for battered wives and abused children. And it's so good that you're working together with the church. He said, well, you know, the church isn't always our best ally. I was kind of shocked. I, I really was the first time. I said, come on, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, no, she said. Uh, in fact, sometimes we almost have some problems with some churches. Now, there's shelters all over this community. But you don't know where they're at. They can't identify themselves. They can't advertise because the abusers oftentimes will go after them. And so they, it really has to be a safe house. Well, that really just shocked me. I said, tell me, wh why, why don't you find that you can always work well with churches? Well, I found out. Would you care to guess who's in those Christian shelters for battered wives and abused children? Pastors' wives, deacons' wives, elders' wives, their kids? Now, that's part of the problem. But there's another part of the problem. A lot of these wives and children have gone to some of their leaders or pastors in their church, and this is what they heard. Well, you just go home and be submissive and trust God. You know, I'd like to tell that guy, why don't you go home for them and get beat up? Well, the Bible requires that they be submissive. Dear Christian, that's not all the Bible says. Why don't you read Romans chapter 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2, where God has provided for government to look after these social problems that we have. And understand the heart of God. Doesn't the heart of God go out to the defenseless, to the widows and the orphans. Isn't that pure and undefiled religion? You see, what's so frustrating about this is, is our logic, I don't think, is very good. Let me ask you a question. If a husband beat up his own wife, and we say, well, that's all right, it's his wife, and they can do whatever they want to in their home. What if he beat up another woman in the church? Would you tolerate that? Well, I'm sure you wouldn't. But it's okay to beat up his own wife? What if a woman uh, was abusing her children at home? And you say, well, it's her children. I guess she has a right to do that. And then she started abusing kids in the nursery. Would you tolerate that in your church? Well, I'm sure you would. But dear Christian, at home, that's not only wrong. I think it's double wrong. Double wrong. If that man is beating up his wife, there's two things that are going wrong here. Number one, she's getting beat up, but she's getting beat up by the one who's charged by God to protect and provide for her. So she's not only getting beat up, she's losing her protection. I say turn them in. Turn them into the law. You say, are you vindictive? Are you mad? No. You will never, never, never help the abuser by allowing them to continue in their abuse. All you will have is a cycle of abuse, and you're going to go right through that. It's one of the most well-attested social phenomena of our time. There ain't a vindictive bone in my body. I believe everybody has a right to throw themselves upon the mercies of God. I remember several years ago, uh, our ministry got called, and a, a man uh, was asking for help, and, and we had the privilege to help this man. It turned out he was sexually abusing his own daughter. And uh, this actually ended up in our book, uh, Released from Bondage. As he told his story, he was run out of his own house at the point of his own gun held by his son when his son found out that his father was abusing his sister. Now, you can't get a worse scenario than this. This is, this is a family absolutely torn apart. Well, he came to us, and, and we did what we could to help this man resolve his conflicts. Uh, when I first met this family, I met only the husband and wife. At that time, they were separated, and the children had left the state. And we sat down, we talked, and her question was, 
What do I do? I can see the change in his life. I believe he's sincere. He's sorry. I think he's done everything he could to uh, be reconciled to God and hopefully us. The kids, however, won't have anything to do with it. But, and he wants me to move back, but if I move back into the house, wouldn't my kids think I'm siding with him? I mean, you can see the problem here. So I said, you just go through this conference. You go through it for yourself. I'm going to trust God to give you that answer when we're done here. If you're right with God, I believe he'll guide you right. And well, that was uh, some years ago. About four or five years passed. My wife and I were out here in California, and we're up in Yosemite. We were just kind of meaning a little vacation between uh, some conferences and out in that beautiful Wawona Lodge, a big old wooden structure down there. And sitting having lunch one day, and behind me I heard, Dr. Anderson? It's one of those test questions, you know. <laughs> Is it him? Uh, anyway, I turned around, I said, do I know you? Well, we're a chapter in your book. <laughs> and then I recognized him. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, I, I didn't recognize you. How are you doing? Oh, we're just doing great, thank you. And you know, last uh, fall, we taught the, our marriage class in our church. Now, my little flesh said, uh, do they know about your past? Now, I, I didn't say that, but I, I had to kind of think that myself. I'll be honest with you. And, but they, would, they wanted to tell me their curriculum, and, and it, they just seemed to be just in love with each other and, and, and back in church and, and ministering to others. And finally, I worked up the courage. I said, well, how are the kids doing? Well, they're doing great. In fact, we're totally reconciled. My son's now going to full-time ministry. Isn't that the grace of God? Would that have happened if nobody had blown the whistle? If nobody would have turned him in? No way it could have happened. You'd just be repeating that cycle again and again and again. I remember sharing that one time. A lady come up to me half in tears after I was speaking, and she said, I knew who I needed to forgive, my mother. And here she was, a mother herself with two children and married. And she said, I could forgive her tonight, but I got to go over to her house next week. And I know what's going to happen next Sunday. She's going to badmouth me and put me down again. I said, put a stop to that. Well, she was almost surprised at my remark. She said, well, aren't I supposed to honor my mother? I said, would you explain to me how allowing your mother to systematically destroy you, which is going to disrupt your marriage and your kids, how in the world would that honor her? I said, by the way, for what it's worth, the commandment in the Old Testament to honor mother and father was probably a commandment given to adults to financially take care of their aging parents. Now, I'm not overcoming the need for children to be submissive to their parents. But mom and dad, you're supposed to, your children are supposed to leave one of you and cleave only to one another. What do you suggest I do? Well, I suggest you go over there next Sunday and say, uh, if she starts that, say, Mom, I love you. But that isn't doing you any good, and that's not doing me any good. And if you're going to continue to do that, I'm going to have to stay away. Because I've got a responsibility to love my husband and to love my kids, and this is not going to get passed on to the next generation. So we're going to have to sit down and talk, because this is just doing nothing but tearing me up and tearing you up too. And I can't be a part of that anymore. I believe you have to do that. You know, Psalm 128 said that our children are like potted plants, but my wife is a fruitful vine. What an image. See, a vine is something that's connected to you, always, never intended to be severed. But a plant is separate. It's intended that they shall leave mom and dad. Look at what, even what Jesus said. He looked uh, at his mother who was trying to tell him what to do at the wedding feast of Canaan. What do I have to do with you, woman? I have to get on with my father's business. That's an interesting statement. Now, if you think that was disrespect, then consider his final words on the cross when he looked down at his mother and said, Behold, your son. I mean, he cared for his mother. Even in his death, he, he discharged that duty to John. So he cared for him, but he had to get on with his father's business. And if we don't do that, dear Christian, we won't stop that cycle of abuse. It'll just be repeated again and again. The iniquities will go on from one to the second to the third generation until we say, No, we don't tolerate that. That's wrong. And if I don't do it now, I'm going to have to do it here. And I don't want that to happen to my kids. Now, it isn't that I don't love my mothers and fathers. And in one sense, don't honor them. I want to take care of them. I want to do what's right. But we've got to stop that cycle. If we allow that thing to tolerate like that, the paradox to me is the secular world is demanding that we do it, and the church is dragging its feet. Whose side are we on? The victim or the abuser? Well, honestly, I'm on both sides. But if I really wanted to help the abuser, I'd say, no more. You can't do that. It's a violation. 
you've totally dishonored the responsibility that God has given you to provide and protect for these kids. And it bothers me so bad that the church didn't take the initiative on it, but the state took it. And the state is required. And for some reason, we want to hide and cover, and it becomes a breeding ground for pedophiles and, and abusers. That, that is absolutely mind-blowing to me. Where is the righteous nature of God? Do you think Jesus would tolerate that in his midst? There is no way that he would do that. So whatever it means to forgive, you need to read a book like uh, Boundaries, for instance. When to say no and say there is some scriptural boundaries that you can set up to say this is abuse and it's going to stop here. And I believe there's legitimate Christian grounds to do something like that. So it's not tolerating sin. It's not seeking resentment, <clears throat> revenge, or repayment. All right, I'm not going to get even. I just want the sole satisfaction of hating that right. To realize that they have been hurt, but they say, but you don't understand how bad they hurt me. I said, they're still hurting you. I was back on the East Coast some time ago, and uh, this dear lady had misery written all over her face, and she was coming all, she couldn't smile. And we got in the back room just for a moment. I was just talking to her, and uh, I said, uh, what's happened to you? Oh, 10 years ago, my best friend ran off with my husband. Oh, man, that's painful, folks. You know what happened to them? Oh, they're going on vacation having a good old time. And she's here thinking somehow or another, if I hang on to this anger and this resentment, that somehow maybe I'm going to get even. I said, can I show you the picture I'm seeing? You're standing here just like this. You're hanging on to the past. You ain't even hanging on to God. He's just hanging on to you. I said, let go of that past. And you grab hold of God. We talked a little bit more, and she said, well, I'll consider it this afternoon. We finished through the steps, and the next day I was preaching in a church. He's up in the choir. She's singing away, and I, pastor's wife was sitting beside me. I said, do you see that girl up there? Yeah, I've been looking at her. We've been working with her for years. What's happened to her? I said, she's free. You see, what's to be gained in forgiveness is freedom. That's what's to be gained. You're still hooked to the past. You're still tied to that event and to that person. You see, reconciliation may then happen. But you don't get reconciled in order to forgive. You forgive in order to reconcile. You don't heal in order to forgive. You forgive in order to heal. That's critical. What's to be gained is freedom. Understand something. I think you can make a case in the Bible that Christ died once for all, that everybody's sins are forgiven on the earth, are all reconciled to God. No. That would require a participation on their part to repent and believe in God. You see, now, think this through for a moment, because this is critical. That's why I can sit in my room or my office and help somebody uh, bring resolution to the problems of their past and truly forgive from the heart, which is their biggest ticket to set them free from their past, without ever going to that other person. In fact, some people that you may need to forgive could be dead. How would you be reconciled to them? In fact, that's very common. I was back on the East Coast one time and doing a conference, and this husband came to me and said, my wife has been committed. She's, she's cutting herself, and she's hearing voices, and, and the court committed her. And, um, and we have two children. She said, is there any possible way you could see her? And so I went out there, and they wouldn't give me any private time, but I could sit in the visiting room where everybody else was at. It was just really awkward, folks. Finally, they gave me a little kind of a separate space, and I was just talking to her, and, and, uh, and she was a graduate of, of Lancaster Bible College. She was a pastor's daughter. It all came down to the whole issue of forgiveness. When finally she came to terms with the need to forgive her father, who was that pastor, who had been dead for many years. When I left that waiting room two hours later, the voices were gone. Her mother was coming to the conference. She said the next day, she said, I don't think my daughter needs to be in there. I said, no, I don't think she does either. I, I honestly don't know what happened after that, but uh, it's not seeking resentment or revenge or repayment. Suppose for a minute that somebody came to me and said, Neil, you know, I'm just under conviction. I've been gossiping about you and, and slandering you for uh, the last few weeks now, and I, I just, I know that's wrong. Would you forgive me? 
Now, if I was to forgive that person, what would that mean? What would I do? How would I do it? Well, I want repayment. How would you repay that? Sue for damages? Would that repay it? Would that make it right? How much would that be worth? Well, go get it back. Are you kidding me? Get it back? It's in Hong Kong now. Isn't it? I mean, it's like a ripple effect. It just goes up. You see, part of my need to forgive that person is to realize that I'd have to bear the consequences of their sin. That's why all forgiveness is efficacious. We are to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Know the passage in Ephesians chapter 4? Put away all bitterness, along with all anger and wrath and clamor and slander. Be tenderhearted, kind towards one another, and forgiving as Christ has forgiven you. How did Christ forgive me? He went to the cross and bore my sin upon himself. He bore the burden of my sin. And so if I said I forgive you, I'm essentially agreeing to live with the consequences of your sin. And I said, well, that ain't fair. Well, of course it's not. But you'll have to anyhow. See, realize that. Everybody here is living with the consequences of somebody else's sin. Everybody here is living with the consequences of Adam's sin. Everybody here is. The only real choice you have is to do that in the bondage of bitterness or the freedom of forgiveness. That's the only real choice you have. And I'm begging you for your sake. Choose forgiveness. That's what sets you free. Somebody said to forgive somebody is to set a captive free and realize you were the captain. And I've seen that happen so many times. We hang on to that bitterness. I remember a young man brought in to me one time. Turned out he'd been in counseling for eight years. It was, it, was, it was a tragic kind of a case because there was very little abuse in his past. Come from a very wealthy family, all high achievers. He himself had graduated from, from college with a 3.4 grade point average or very high like that. And now he was working as a gardener. And every time he did, he had mad on his face all the time, <laughs> working around. And he came in and eight years of counseling, somebody handed him a couple of my books and wanted to see me. So we sat down, and I heard his story. And I mean, most of us just kind of scratch your head. I said, hey, Wiz, that's, you've got more going for you than almost anybody I know. And somehow he's bitter about it. Well, we got to forgiveness, and that was the only person I've ever taken through the steps that wouldn't go any further. He said, and I explained forgiveness to him, and he made a list, and he said, sorry, I ain't going to do it. Well, I said, well, I care enough about you to help you realize the consequences. Now, here's a guy who chose to hang on to his bitterness, hang on to his anger, because he was using his anger as a way of protecting himself from any further abuse. Or any other relationships, for that matter. He was just a lonely guy now in his own bitterness. And so we talked a little bit more. When that happens, I said, well, I respect your right to make that decision. That's, that's a choice that you have to make. He said, well, can we go on to the others? I said, no, it wouldn't do any good. You know, I'll be here for you, and I want you to know we're friends. I want you to know you can come back. When that happens, pave the way back. You can come back any time. I respect you, right? And he walked out. Well, about a month later, he's working in the garden near where I was working, and I walked by, and he said, Hi. He said, uh, By the way, do I have to forgive him all at once? <laughs> about two months passed, and he came to a conference like this, and now you ought to see him, folks. He let it go. He let it go. He let the past go. And he let God be the revenger if there ever was need any at all. It's resolving to live with the consequences of another person's sin. And it's not using the past against them. That doesn't mean that we don't stand in a court of trial for the sake of law and righteousness in our country. But the point of it is, if you have to testify to somebody, if you have to go confront somebody, forgive them first. Otherwise, your whole motive for going is probably going to be colored. If you have to do that, make sure your own heart is right. We are told, don't let a writ of bitterness spring up whereby many are defiled. Well, you're never alone in your bitterness. It always affects you in the way that you relate to other people as well. It's like a poison and a cancer that kind of spreads throughout our bodies. You say, where's the justice in all this? The answer is, it's in the cross. Christ died once for all. Your sins, my sins, her sins, his sins. Once for all. You take the cross out of this, and it's mockery. There couldn't be any forgiveness. That's why the world doesn't fully understand this. But we should understand this, because this is what it's all about. We're just forgiven as we've been forgiven. We're just being merciful as we've been uh, extended mercy to by God himself. 
Can you settle something? You will never have perfect justice in this lifetime. And boy, given the court cases we've seen in our country the last three years, if you're still hoping for that, dear friend, you're, you're uh, the wrong trail. Now, to me, that's a desire. I want justice in our land. I want it wherever I go. But if you're looking for perfect justice, you're going to have to wait to the right way of throne. That's why I think there is a final judgment someday. God will make this right in the end. I remember a case in California a few years back where a man had a wife and five children, and, and uh, he started having an affair with a gal about half his wife's age. His wife found out about it, uh, telephoned the young lady, arranged a meeting, took a gun, shot the young gal, premeditated murder. She's now serving a life sentence. The young gal is dead, and there's not a law in her land that can touch that husband. Do you call that justice? If justice happened in the Old Testament, what would happen to him? He'd be stoned to death. You will not have perfect justice in this lifetime. That's why we have to trust God for that. He will make this right in the end. Meanwhile, God has given us a provision by which, even though everybody here is going to be hurt, damaged, sinned against sometime in their life, has a means to say, I'm not going to let that control me. I'm going to get on with my life. I'm going to forgive from my heart and let that go. Now, how do you do that? Well, what we do is we help people pray and ask God who they need to forgive and make a list. Allow yourself to do that. Even in the face of denial, we've had people pray, God, would you show me who I need to forgive from my heart? Well, there's nobody. I said, would you just share names now that are coming to your mind? And brrr, 20 names come out. And we spend the next few hours or minutes working through that process. I remember I had a, a man who actually was a counselor, been a pastor at one time, loved our material, but he just couldn't work through it on his own. So we sat one afternoon and he prayed and he out came a list, 43 people. A lot of offenses and a lot of hurt, a lot of damage done to this man. And he looked at me and said, uh, well, you, you just don't have enough time. I said, I'll stay all night if I have to. And he broke down and began to cry. He said, you're the first person that's ever told me that. This isn't a timed exercise. You open up that wound in the past, stay with it long enough to close it. And you work through each and every one of that. But start by making a list. Then you face the hurt and the hate. I have to be honest with you, Christians. This is the great evangelical slide over. Well, I gave my, I forgave my dad. Well, that's tremendous. What for? Well, things he did. Well, what did he do? I don't want to talk about it. See, you just bypass forgiveness. If you're going to forgive from the heart, you've got to acknowledge the hurt and the hate. You've got to be able to honestly admit that and say, yes, you know, I feel that way. I had one young lady told me one time, I can't forgive my mother, I hate her. I said, now you can. Now you can. I'm not asking you to like her. I'm asking you to forgive her. I, I can imagine that people of Germany had to forgive Hitler after the war. As soon as they were done, would they say, well, now I like the guy? You can't like evil or abuse. That, that's not what God's asking you to do. You can't play with your emotions that way. But if you've got to forgive from your heart, you're going to have to get down to that emotional core. And if you don't allow that to get down, see, that's what we're trying to avoid. We keep trying to push it down. God keeps trying to surface it. That's why it occupies your mind. That's why he himself will turn us over the tormentors. And so he, we won't let a day go by where we won't uh, come to terms with that. And then he said, don't hang on. Because if you do, you're going to be tied to that event. You're going to be tied to that past. And there's no way you're going to get on with your life. You have to forgive. As Christ has forgiven you. Decide you'll bear that burden and not hold it against them. Then you take it to the cross. Forgiveness, dear Christian, is a choice. It's a crisis of the will. I can't overstate how important it is to realize Reconciliation may or may not happen, but your freedom cannot be dependent upon whether another person will cooperate or not cooperate with you. Your freedom in Christ is purely an issue between you and your Heavenly Father. That's why you could be free tonight, or you could be free in a prison someplace. It doesn't make any difference where you're at. It's, it's part of your relationship with God. Now, whether or not you're reconciled to somebody is not totally dependent upon you. The Bible says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. 
but it doesn't always depend on you. If that person doesn't want to get right with you, will not be reconciled with you, and you won't forgive until he is, every sick person in this world could hold you hostage the rest of your life and keep you in bondage. That's why it has to be an issue between just you and God. It cannot be dependent upon other people that you have no right or ability to control. It's a choice. Let me share my crisis. Everybody has one, and everybody here has to forgive people on a routine basis, really. The key is don't let the bitterness come in the first place. Uh, but if it does, and we know it when it's there, the heart knows its own bitterness, the Bible says. So we know that. And so somewhere we have to come to that crisis event in our life when I face that issue and decide to, to bear that burden and, and let that person go, let God be the revenger, and get on with my life. I was a young pastor. I was, uh, it was my second uh, calling in ministry. Before that, I had been college and, and uh, associate pastor in a large church. This is my first senior pastor role. And I was kind of excited about it, but I walked right into kind of the classic buzzsaw. I'm not trying to pick on anybody here, but I was uh, fairly young, and all my board was charter members. I was the second pastor this church had had. And there was some very severe ownership issues here. <laughs> and, and I walked in. I was excited about it. And uh, within a matter of about two months, I knew I was heading for a crash course. One particular man had basically been in some controlling or prominent position for the 10 years' existence of that church. And I'm not a fighter. You may, I may look like I, I'm really not. I'm a lover, folks. And if you want to fight, go out and start without me. You know, I'll be out in 10 minutes. But I, I, I'm really not. I won't be intimidated. You can't intimidate me. I'm not a weakling in that sense, but I'm not a fighter. And so I, I, I'm not afraid to confront either. So I went up to his house, and I said, you know, I don't think things are right between you and I right now. And it's like negotiating with North Vietnam, you know. <laughs> a war? What war? Well, anyway, I asked if he would agree to meet with me once a week for breakfast. I, I can tell you before God, in my own heart, I wasn't trying to change him. I, I just wanted to see if I could establish some kind of a meaningful relationship. I said, I'm only asking one thing of you. If you've got a problem with me or what I'm doing, share it with me. Now, let's not make this a board or staff issue. And so I just threw myself at his mercy. Well, he shared with me every week. <laughs> I can't tell you how bad I hated that next six months every Monday morning. I mean, I mean it ruined every Sunday afternoon for me. <laughs> I'd go and It was a sparring match. Uh, I just couldn't seem to get beyond it. Now, my naivety at that time, I thought I'd get along with anybody. Not if they don't want to, you can't. Well, about three months into that series, I um, had nosed around the church a little bit, and I found out there was a pretty good-sized chunk of people that would like to go to Israel with me if I put together a tour. So I went to the board, and I, I told them... Uh, I would use my own vacation to go, but I asked permission to do that. And he shot up his hand. He said, no, I know how that works. If he gets enough to go with him, he can go for nothing. I've given him a bonus. Isn't it usually the richest person in the church that says that? <laughs> I said, well, if that's going to be a problem, then uh, I'm requesting vacation time and another date to go on my own. Now, I didn't say that in spite. That was another option that I had. I just really wanted to go. But if, I was, if it was going to be a problem to put a tour away, I didn't, I didn't want that. So, so I went. It was one of the greatest spiritual journeys in my life. It really honestly was. And since I didn't have the responsibility, it freed me up more to do other things anyhow. And I was the only pastor on the tour. So I got to do the baptizing in the Jordan and the communion at the Garden Tomb. So I mean, it was just a, it was an incredible spiritual highlight for me. But I knew what was going to be a special place on that tour. Down in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is a valley between the Mount of Olives and the beautiful gate, the eastern gate, I should say, is up there, is, that, uh, is a beautiful mosaic structure called the Church of All Nations. It encompasses the rock where they believe that Jesus cried out and said, If it be thy will, remove this cup from me. Finally, a third time, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Well, we went through there on the tour, and I heard the spiel, and I came back the next afternoon. It was off. And I just was walking around. I went down there and I sat in there for a while. Actually, a good part of that afternoon. It was one of those heart issues for me. I suddenly realized that is where the battle was fought. That's where the decision was made. From that point on, it was just a question of duty, of following it out and going to the cross and making that sacrifice. But it also hit me 
that his crisis of a decision was not to take the sin of one man upon himself, but the sin of all mankind. And all he was asking me to do is to take the sin of one man. And I realized that. I said, I can do that. I will do that. I choose to do that. And I left there with a sense of uh, freedom and liberation. I went back and things went quite well, actually. Didn't have me to pick on. So he picked on my youth pastor. Oh, man, that did it. Well, I don't know about you, but I frankly can take more than I can watch somebody else take. And that really got me. He was, I had a wonderful youth pastor. And so I went to our December board meeting. Bad timing, folks. I was a young pastor, all right? And, but right before Christmas, I made my little stand. I said, you either do something about him or the staff is resigning. As far as I was concerned, this is a sham and I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. Well, they were all shocked and the board chairman looked at me and said, what do you suggest we do? I said, I suggest you meet without us, but I am not living with what is. Well, three terrible weeks went by and I got a letter. They had met without us and the note says, listen, we arranged for a meeting for the two of you to come ask each other forgiveness and we're going to build our buildings. We were halfway through a building program at that time. I mean, I was shocked, honestly. I said, great, sweep it under the carpet. We'll trip over it later. <laughs> well, I went to the meeting as best as I could with an honest heart, and I asked his forgiveness for not loving him, because I didn't. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't feel good about that. You know, I, I felt very bad about that, actually. And uh, so I knew I needed to do that to be right with God, and so I did. But I didn't back down, and he wasn't going to do anything. And so it was a stalemate, and, uh, and I left. And uh, I found out one of the hard things of life. I mean, it's just a reality, whether we like it or not. There's a lot of people. I think all the rest of the board would stand with me privately, but not publicly. And uh, you're going to find that's going to be true sometime in this world, unfortunately. So I saw they weren't going to do anything about it, and I can't be stubborn, so I decided I would resign. I uh, wrote out Wednesday morning my resignation. Wednesday night... My temperature was 103 and a half, and I totally lost my voice. <laughs> Couldn't say a thing. Now, it doesn't take a genius to recognize God is not pleased with my decision. <laughs> I did not resign that next Sunday. I would have crawled there, but I still didn't have a voice. And so I called a denominational leader in, and he came and and, uh, and preached, and he did come over to my house for dinner afterwards. I'm not sure of my thinking here. Uh, but he said, oh, this is so exciting. Your church has tripled, and a lot of new members, and building program. And I said, I know, but I'm going to resign next Sunday. Oh, he was shocked. and He was the only guy I ever talked to outside of, you know, our staff. And he said, you mean the guy that never sings? I said, yeah, him. And, uh, well, he, we talked that afternoon, and prayed together. He said, uh, I don't agree with your decision. I think you need to stay the course. And, but I was stubborn, so I stayed home for a while. And when you're flat on your back, folks, there's nowhere to look but up, right? So I'm reading through the Gospel of Mark, and it came to a passage where they uh, took a blind man and led him to Jesus. And the Lord touched him. He said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees. And he touched him a second time. He said, now what do you see? He said, I see men clearly. Oh, man, I got the message, folks. I was seeing this man like a tree. He was an obstacle in my path. He was blocking my goal. Oh, no, he wasn't, folks. You want to know the truth? God used that man more than any other man on planet Earth make me the pastor God wanted me to be. I think God does that. I think he just comes along. You got your whole future charted. And then he comes along and plops a tree right down in front of you. There, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> you know what the flesh says? Give me a chainsaw. <laughs> I said, God, I don't love that man. But I know you do. And I want to but you're going to have to touch me. And God did. Tell you what, folks, it's one of those crisis moments that you have with God that, that then comes Jesus in a way you never anticipated or believed before. 
I finally got to church. I preached on that passage, actually. I said, there are three types of people in this world. There are blind people. Satan has blinded the mind of the unbelieving. And we have to take them by the hand and lead them to Jesus. And then there are people who see others like trees. We compare our leaves with each other. We scratch each other with our branches, but we're not trees. We're people created in the image of God. And then there are those who have been touched by God. I gave an invitation that morning. I had no idea what I was getting. I don't even remember what I gave. It's just, y'all want to come forward? But, and, uh, <laughs> and when I gave that invitation that morning, I had no idea what was going to happen next. But people all over the church got up and started coming forward. The front of the church couldn't hold them all. The doors opened up and they spilled out into the lawn. People were going across the aisles asking each other forgiveness. I hadn't even talked about that. The organist and the pianist... Uh, couldn't even play anymore because they were crying and sobbing. I don't believe there's no more than 15 people still seated. Care to guess who one of them was? <laughs> you know, to my knowledge, he never changed. Uh, but I did. I, I really was never quite the same after that. And neither was the church in a lot of ways. Revival came only after this old pastor got his heart right with God. I learned one of life's tough lessons, that God is fully capable of cleaning his own fish, folks. Ours is just to love him. And uh, we went on and we built our building at vote 8 to 1, 8 to 1, you know, so what? I just got to tell you this. There is not one person on planet Earth that can keep you from being the person God created you to be. There isn't. The only one that can stop that from happening is ourselves. And I think God just put him there for a purpose. To find out if I could love the unlovely. If I was going to be a controller or trust God to do what he can do in other people's lives. Just assume my own responsibility to love people. I thank God for that experience. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. God in your own heart can allow you to do to others what he has done to you. Everybody here has been hurt. Criticized, rejected, maybe even far worse things. We're not minimalizing that. We're just trying to say there's only one way to stop the pain. There's only one way to let it go, and that's to forgive. God has no other plan for you. And thank God for that. And thank God for the one who forgave all that we could forgive a few. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for the grace of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God. Thank you, Lord, for that. While our heads are bowed, Lord, I'm asking on behalf of everybody here, would you reveal to our minds who it is that we need to forgive? I know you've been doing it before already, Lord. While your heads are bowed, let me ask a, just a critical question in our time together. Is there somebody, one or more, that you know that you need to forgive are you willing to do it? Do you know that you need the grace of God to do that? Apart from Christ, you can't. And you need him to touch you. Are you willing to, to ask him for that, for his help, for his grace, which will be sufficient? If you are, I'm going to ask you to do something very important. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to have to say anything. But I think we all need to respond to God right now in an appropriate way. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to say, Lord, I will forgive whoever you bring to my mind. And God, I need you to help me. I need you to touch me. And if you're willing to do that, would you stand with me right now, wherever you're at? Wherever you're at. And all you're saying is, God, I'm standing to tell you I'm willing to forgive. And I'm also standing, God, to say I'm asking you to touch me. To touch my heart. God, give me the grace to forgive, to let it go. And while your heads are bowed, consider that, dear Christian, for a moment, to let it go. There's been enough pain. There's been enough hurt. Whatever it is that's binding you to your past, for your sake, let it go. Let it go. Let God deal with that. Let him minister to you right now. Now can we all stand together? Father, thank you for the privilege of knowing you. 
Thank you that you have provided an answer for all of us, that we can live our life free and alive in Christ, that we can be free from our past, to stop that pain. And Lord, as we stood before you, asking for your grace to do this, God, I pray that you would just bring those healing in, of our memories, that we could be totally free. And God, thank you for that. We love you for it, for giving us a way to overcome our past, to be the people that you've created us to be. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, would you do just one thing for me that I can't do? Would you turn around and hug somebody and tell them you love them? Would you do that for me? God bless you.